Peace, what's going down? It's DJ Payne One for BeatStars.com. I have a very special guest today. He's produced for everybody from Kendrick Lamar to Ab Soul to Joey Badass. And he's another uh, another producer whose name people often misspell. It's Curtis King. Curtis <laughs> with two S's. Shout out to Curtis King. Appreciate you uh, coming on. It was kind of last minute. We made it work. Sure. Uh, so appreciate, appreciate you having me on. Yeah, of course, of course, of course. Um, congratulations on on uh, YouTube Platinum status. You just hit a million views uh, not too long ago, correct? Yes, yes. I definitely just hit that. That was a, a milestone for me because I had no idea it was coming up. I wasn't even anticipating it until I saw an odd number that doesn't usually belong on my page, which is a million. <laughs> that's, that's how it happens. The plaque is in the mail. Um, so you... you make YouTube videos obviously uh, centered around production and, and um, also just being an entrepreneur in, in the music world. Absolutely. You've done rap, you've done some high profile events, you, you produce music, you, you do a whole bunch of stuff. Right. And, and you're not associated with a major record label. Absolutely. So in, in spite of your resume, you're not associated with, with a, major record labels. So is it fair to call you DIY? Absolutely. I, I have actually funny because I have a project called DIY. It's an EP I have called DIY EP. That's literally been a staple of my career, a staple of my my um, voice per se within this music has always been, even from the beginning when I wanted to make beats and when I wanted to learn how to produce, nobody would teach me. There was nobody around that really knew how to do it. And the ones that did know how to do it weren't really trying to share information you know, say for instance, the videos that I do, the videos that you do as well. I mean, that's that was my introduction to you, was giving the information that a lot of people sort of hoard. But that was my introduction, was um, literally having to learn this on my own. I picked up a PlayStation game, shout out to MTV Music Generator, because <laughs> it spawned this career that I didn't, you know, think would span another 13 to 14 years. Um, but it's it's certainly been a DIY journey. Yeah, a few a few producers have come up off that game, right? It, uh, then um, there's a producer that's associated with you from uh, from TDE, right? Who, who also used that? I want to say I was reading up. It was uh, is his name Tay? Yeah, Tay Beast. That's one of my mentors, Tay did, Beast. So did yeah. he, he used that program too, right? From what I from what I know, he he's, he seems to be even that being my boy for years, he's very secretive about the, his his uh his process. <laughs> And where he started. Yeah, I, I feel you, man. Because I saw a video of yours recently where you were talking, I think it was called this, this, The Biggest Secret About the Hip Hop Music Industry. Biggest Line Hip Hop. Yes. Yeah, the, the biggest line hip hop. And it was, it was all about just the, the intergenerational schism, if you will. It's like there's a, there's a, a, a line drawn where, you know, there's no communication between the generations. And so, you have this complete disconnect and you know that probably has, I'm, I'm going way off topic that probably has a lot to do with you know this this view that we're having you know like the new generation oh man oh but it's all you know it was skinny right. jeans and ringtone rap and now it's <laughs> mobile rap and, and different colored dreads and stuff is crazy yeah i mean but you, that is sort of the the story of my journey the last year and a half because i haven't been doing videos for years you know, I, you, I, I look to you and, and you know, honestly, I, I admire what you've been doing for so long because you've been doing it for a minute. I came into the the the, the, uh, the spectrum of doing that within the last year and a half, I'd say, uh, almost two years now, where basically I, I, I saw a void. I saw that there was an abundance of information that just wasn't being shared. There's a lot of artists and producers out here who want that information and thirsty for it, and they don't know how to go about it. And I saw a divide where here I am as a middle-aged rapper. I have one opportunity at, at the age of 31 at that time to be in a position where the OGs respect what I say and the younger artists respect what I say. Well, why wouldn't I use my sort of uh, platform to be a bridge? So that was my main goal was to be a bridge within that. And I mean, that's that's right in line with hip hop culture anyway. That's why this whole divide just kind of really disheartens me because it's it's just it's, it's it goes against the culture to create these divides and to say, you know, I don't care about the next generation. I don't care about the previous generation. You know, what I mean, it's just right. it's such a weird concept for somebody 
probably like you, probably like me, who came up in the 90s listening to hip hop in the, in the late 80s, 90s, and seeing right. what it was, you know, everybody schooling everybody. And then you look even further back in the 70s and you see that it was Flash who taught this DJ and that DJ and <laughs> this producer yeah. taught, you know, Marley Mar taught this, you know what I mean? So it was just this right. like the crew mentality. There'd be the young dudes, you know, when I was, when I was, uh, younger, there were people schooling me and, you know, whether it was right. making DJing or graffiti or digging or whatever, someone was always there to teach me. Not so much producing though, because I couldn't touch, you know, I saw the Triton, but I couldn't touch it. I couldn't touch the MPC. I didn't know what I was doing. Oh. They wouldn't let me, but. You should have saw the way they tortured me when I first started becoming a producer. And they, you know, I, I walk in with this PlayStation game and they're like, okay, you're going to have to leave out of here. And then when I transitioned to the PlayStation <laughs> game, I went to FL Studio. And then you got the whole hardware versus software. It, it's just, to me, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of childish debates about, you know, what's real this or what's real hip hop or what's real producing. And I don't know how often you hear those in other genres, but it's something that it, it disheartens me because I love hip hop so much and I love all aspects of hip hop. And I, and I really compare hip hop to a human being. Like you can't, you know, it's funny because I, I listen to a lot of self-help, you know, information that be it Tony Robbins or Les Brown. And Tony Robbins says something where you can't say that you love somebody, you know, or, or even that you hate them and, and, not give them credit for the good that they contributed to your life. So that being said, there's a new generation of hip hop where their whole goal is to be young hip hop. And you know, and, and what it means to be young hip hop means that you have to literally alienate the elders before that. And through their art, that's what they're doing. It's becoming polarizing to each generation, the same way that the 90s was polarizing to the 80s and the, uh, the introduction of hip hop you know, uh, coming from the, the roots of blues and coming from the roots of traditional R&B, these things are supposed to happen, but it, it just seems like, and it's funny because a lot of my peers who don't realize they're that old man with the fist kind of, oh, you kids get off my yard. And, and I never wanted to be that guy, not because I, I, I wish to stay young forever, but I, I want to make sure that the bridge is strong and that for the sake of hip hop, because like I guess I love hip hop so much. For the sake of hip hop, we should be be the ones bridging that together and showing him in, in, in a sharing game. And now with how the internet is, there's no excuse not to be, you know, sharing things from you know here to here to Australia and whatnot and back. And it, it seems to be working too for your brand. I mean, you you said you haven't been doing this for very long with the with the um with the videos, and right. you're already you know hitting that seven figure number. Uh, and really, for me, right, right when I really saw your brand start taking off, where I had to kind of stop and say, "Oh, damn, that's Curtis," was right before you dropped the the um, "Such a Trap" EP with with Murs. Okay, word. It wasn't even an EP. It was like an album slash mixtape kind of thing, right? Pretty much <laughs> an assortment of beats and him him rapping like a fool over them. <laughs> but but twenty thousand downloads on 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 that piff alone. So I'm sure it got a lot more on other platforms. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I, so how did that even how did that even come together? Because Murs is, is a very random individual. Murs is is, is pretty much it's, it's my OG. It's my big brother, you know. And, and and I'm thankful to have found him, even though I feel like I found that particular OG at a later part of my career. I met him when a buddy of mine campaigned to be on his festival that he had a few years ago called Pay Dues. And my buddy got on, and then a year later, I campaigned for 97 days straight. And when I say campaign, I don't mean just pushing things on the internet. I was going to barbershops and putting my posters up, Curtis King for paid dues. And I was having people uh, <clears throat> at his Twitter account and I was showing up to shows that he was at and I was getting people to say, yo, Curtis King for paid dues. <clears throat> and after that campaign, it led me to that stage in front of 10,000 people. And from there, we kind of just built on more so uh, a friendship level than it kind of built into me providing production for him. We did a Christmas song together and you know, long story short, he hit me up one time and he said, yo, Curtis, you got any trap beats? Because I was known as the sample producer, like all the stuff I did with Kendrick and Ab Soul is sample based hip hop. So he hit me on a random like, you got any trap beats? And I said, well, I could <laughs> seeing the opportunity. In it, and I started actually putting stuff together and learning the craft, respecting the craft of, of, of trap production um, and figuring out how to do it with my sound and working on that project literally 
it pushed me in another place uh, for my production because it gave me the opportunity to kind of show what I can do outside of traditional hip hop. So doing that kind of 50 50 endeavor, you know, one rapper, one producer for the whole project. Right. How, how was that in terms of, um, you know, brand building in, in terms of just the production process overall that that either benefited you or surprised you compared to what you have been doing up to that point? Well, here's a difference with working with MERS on that project is that he gave me the opportunity to be an actual producer. You know, I think there, there's sort of um, the, the language of what it means to be a producer versus a beat maker gets lost. And you've covered that many a times. But for me, I had always been literally the beat maker and not by choice. I would literally make my beat. I would send them off. And I've known Abso for years and years, but they have a very specific way they like to lay out the production. And a lot of times they take those production hats, they being TDE and everybody that's in there. So I never really had an opportunity to go in there and say, I think the vocals would sound better over this part. I think we should make a bridge here. And Merz gave me that opportunity to really be the producer. So from a branding aspect, he also let me take care of sort of the marketing campaign too. He was just really open to it. And to me, it was just the ultimate nod for somebody that respectable, somebody in that that somebody I look up to, to give me the opportunity to say, look, on this particular date, we're going to release this on this date. So he let me run the plays. And, you know, it was fun to learn on the fly with somebody on his level of what those things can do and then how I can kind of transfer those over to myself as an artist and producer. Okay, so you're, you're working with independent artists, you're doing these projects, you're working with major artists, but you're still DIY, you're not associated with a major label. Right. Um, you know, I you know I make videos for the the aspiring artists a lot. So you know, so do you. And Absolutely. a lot of feedback I get is from people saying, "There's no money in the game anymore unless you produce for Drake, <laughs> unless you produce for these um, you know worldwide pop sensations." Right. You're not making any money. But when I look at your videos, you seem energized. You seem motivated. You don't look like you want to jump out of a window and end it all. <laughs> so, so is this how is this possible how is it possible that you're diy and, and you're right. doing what you love and supporting yourself i'll tell you this and, and i know there's probably a lot of younger producers that are listening and here's the issue i have and this is a real stat and this is not even like to boast or anything like that but 10 years of pursuing placements and i'm talking about all the names that you see on my credits 10 years of pers pursuing those placements i made more money leasing my beats within the first years. Now, mind you, this is actively getting placements, this is actively pushing for them, and this is actively trying to move up. Here's the problem, within that placement game initially, what shot me in the foot was that I had a lot of samples. And when you got the samples, obviously you gotta go through the clearance situation. A lot of times you're not getting paid what you would have gotten paid had it been an original beat because you're kind of cutting in on publishing, you're cutting in on opportunities for the music to get placed. A lot of things you're kind of working against you, and that's what I that's where I was at with it. But the reason why I'm not jumping out a window is because I went from that 10 years is a is a crazy journey. And I just wrote a book called The Prosperous Hip Hop Producer that's you know getting edited and whatnot. I hope they don't butcher me for that. Um, but it's getting edited now and it, and it, it made me, re it reminded me of the journey that's been, man, I'll tell you like this, to go from staying on a buddy's couch and trying to figure out how we going to get our next meal from, is a Del Taco that used to be around our house, trying to figure out how to get our next meal. I'm literally making beats in the living room, sleeping in the living room. I had a little cubby hole where I was making stuff to go from there to now, you know, this house ain't a mansion, but I'm living comfortably and I'm taking care of a family of three off of my production alone and just having the freedom to get up every day and say, do I want to make beats or do I want to make videos or do I want to go to the gym or do I want to do all of them? And, and to me, that gives me such satisfaction because I'm first of all grateful where I'm at. I'm grateful of, I know where I've been and I know how, how bad things can get. I've had some very low moments, but to be here now, I, I'm full of so much energy because now not only is my life in a great place financially? I'm helping people. I'm seeing it every single day. There's no, there's no, there's no way in hell I could have a bad day. And every day I'm seeing somebody leave a comment like, "Yo, thank you for doing this video. How to count 16 bars? You changed my whole perspective." That kind of stuff. It may do something different for somebody else. For me, if it, it fulfills me. And uh, something Tony Robbins always says is that 
as human beings, we have six needs, but if we fulfill these two needs, we'll forever be happy and fulfilled. And those two needs are growth and contribution to a bigger cause. And so this is what I'm doing. I'm growing every day by making myself a better producer, learning different things about the tactics and, and the skills. And then two, I'm contributing to something that's bigger than me by giving this information to people that I've never met in my life. So you so you made a video instructing people on how to count bars? Yeah, I have a, I have a, I have a how, to, how to count. You know what's crazy? I, and I know you've probably been in situations where you've been in a studio and you ask yourself, does this rapper know how to count 16 bars? Because and the answer is usually no. <laughs> are, are, are they trying to play it off? They try to be real cool about it, like, nah, nah, just just tell me where it stops or something. I'll put a little sound yeah. effect. And it's crazy because there's rappers that I looked up to, and I'll be in the studio with them, and I'm like, this fool can't count 16 bars. And it like dawned on me, and in the middle of me trying to, you know, kind of do the engineer producer thing, I'm like, this fool cannot count 16 bars, but it can wrap circles around a beat. That's what got me to say, okay, what was my biggest uh, obstacle as a as a songwriter and lyricist in the beginning? It was lack of information. Now, I mean, producers and songwriters are so lucky now because you get, you know, a Google search now is not what a Google search was 12 years ago. And a lot of stuff I was getting were like, <laughs> you know, these. Uh, remember, I bought a book. Like, I'm, mind you. People don't understand me. I'm the type of guy to get, get, get stuff like this. Hold on. And this might be even embarrassing. Let me get this. This is Curtis King. Curtis King does stuff like this. He buys a book like How to Rap. Because me, I don't need this to learn how to rap, but I love to see in text form, you know, different tactics and, and, and somebody actually break them down in a scientific way. That's just how I am. So when it came to getting this information, I had to learn you know, piece by piece how to make this work. But um, thankfully, you know, that has led me to now what I'm doing and, and making that 16 bar verse uh, video. That's like one of my most popular videos now. It's just, it's, it's eye opening to see how many people need that information. So I want to keep on providing it. Hey, well, God bless you for that video. Um, <laughs> so to go back to something that you said a minute ago about, about um, making the majority of your income off of the beat leasing revenue stream. Right. Uh, someone asked me this question recently about that world. It was, uh, I think it was producer grind. Um, they asked okay. me if selling beats, cause I just recently started selling beats online with, um, okay. with stars. And you know, so that's a totally different world now. I, I was, uh, I was really uh, <laughs> identifying with, with your story of chasing placements for 10 years. You know, I was doing the, the label runs and this and that, and it was crazy. Right, um, man, the politics. <laughs> yeah, but, but now, same as you now that I've taken control of my brand and I'm working a lot more on, you know, 50, 50 DIY projects or, mm -hmm. you know, teaching or, um, you know, selling, uh, production and, and related services to independent unsigned artists. I'm making right. way more income now than I was when I was, you know, you know, and not to say that right. there's not money in the placement world, but sure there are a million different ways to support yourself in the music industry. You just kind of have to figure it out. But the yeah. question that I was asked was, does selling beats online impede your ability to work with high profile artists? You know, what's funny is that to answer that question, when I, cause when I stopped pursuing placements, I was in a place where I was like almost angry at the industry because it was like, here I am. I invested all this time. I had placements, but they weren't necessarily garnering the other placements that I thought I was going to get because of those, they weren't having that ripple effect that I wanted. And what happened was I kind of got angry at the industry and I was like, you know what? Forget that. Because the one thing that I learned within the industry is they say, never share your secrets, never tell anybody anything, never tell, you know, keep all your stuff to yourself. This is your secret recipe. And in that video, that the biggest line hip hop, what I was talking about is that Martha Stewart, you know, one of them, you know, we all know her for the stuff that she cooks and everything. She gives you every single piece of her ingredient. And she knows that she's so valuable to her audience. You can literally take her ingredients, make a store, set up shop next to her, and you're not going to put her out of business. So understanding it from that aspect, I kind of I kind of left the the placement game and went straight to the to the the the, uh, the leasing beats. And the ironic thing is this: I lease my beats. All of a sudden, I start getting phone calls because when people see you that you're moving, when they see that you have some motion, it don't matter where that motion is going. All my industry contacts started hitting me up like, yo, do you have any production? You know, what's going on? I see you building up your website and 
you know, let me know what you got. I started leasing my beats. I started getting more placements. <laughs> the irony of it, like even a buddy of mine, uh, Awesome Beats, he he leased a beat to a buddy of uh, Jay Mills. And Jay Mills ends up using it and that becomes another placement within his belt. Now, obviously, it's different when it comes to the, the amount of money that you get. But to know that you can still get those placements and still keep your tracks, because there you already know the, the, the situation where you can send a beat to somebody and on average, you send a beat to somebody, say they want to use it. You don't hear back from them for three or four years. Or not four years, three or four months if you don't have a relationship with them. Yeah, yeah. Then, three or four uh, years for me. Uh, with, with, with that's the, even realistic too, right? Yeah, yeah. And then you actually get words you got the placement. Still got to wait another quarter before you get that actual distribution of money. So in this whole time that you're waiting, 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 you're accumulating debt if you're not getting other placements. That's what I was doing. I was accumulating debt. And then, too, I wasn't generating income because I was doing this full time. So to answer that question, I don't think it impedes anything. I think if anything, it puts you in a position where our biggest problem as producers, artists, whatever the case may be, is obscurity. I learned that from Grant Cardone is that our biggest problem is small businesses, whatever you want to call it, entrepreneurs is obscurity. How do you get yourself to be known for something and hopefully something sustainable and something positive? For me, I had to figure out, okay, how do I get my production out there? How do I do it in the leasing business? And I'll tell you, the biggest thing for me was that I, when I pursued placements, I felt like an employee. When I started establishing my business within the leasing business, I felt like an actual entrepreneur. Now they look down at us in the industry because they look and say, oh, look at you selling your beast for $19 or $39. And that's your leasing beast. That's so cheap. But that kind of mentality, I feel like, only exists within the hip hop or within the hip hop genre because nobody goes and says, oh, why would you open up a Walmart and selling everything? But why would you open up a 99 cent store? And you're selling all. Nobody says that. That person is their business and that's what they do. And it's a multi million dollar business because of the way that they scale it. Same thing applies to us, you know, when we're releasing beats. But the thing is, people don't see that mentality. And what happens is a lot of producers kind of get stuck in a gray area and they never fully commit to either side. And then they just say, to hell with it, the industry's not making any money. And that's just not the truth. Yeah, and, and, and to, uh, not committing to either side. That, kind of, and, uh, uh, that concept can be applied to a lot of different situations. Um, I guess, lastly, I want to ask if you ever had a let's call it a damn that hurt moment because that's my my tagline. Um, I okay. guess what I mean is a, a low point or a bad decision you made within your career that that you learned from. I mean, I I had a, I had one. I'll share it with you because you're from the West Coast. Okay. Um, okay. It was back and uh, um, many many years ago, probably either right before or right after my first major placement. Okay. And there was an artist. Who was initially who was originally from a group, um, and they had a hot single, but the group kind of fell apart, and so he was pursuing a solo career. Right. And he contacted me, um, or I contacted him actually. Sent him some tracks. He goes, "Yeah, yeah. Send send me fifteen beats. I'll have fifteen songs to you by tomorrow." I was like, "Whoa, I don't know about that." I was oh, on wow. my whole <laughs> thing. You know, I wasn't ready for that kind of. That kind of process i didn't understand that kind of process and it's it's still seems sure. really, you know unconventional anyway i just kind of let the email sit the rapper was little b wow so that was a damn that hurt moment because if i had just kind of done my research and seen the trend and, and you right. know exactly the kind of charisma he had and, and his his overall career trajectory i would have said right yeah, Let's do it. I, I trust in your process, even though it's completely uncomfortable for me. So, so you have a <laughs> See, moment like that. that initially, <laughs> and I have a story for that too. But initially, when you said that, I'm like, who's making 15 songs in 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 the day? And I said, little, okay, a little bit. Yeah, yep. okay. I, that completely makes sense. Now. Now that completely makes sense. But for me, honestly, and it may be a lot, uh, 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 a lot less hilarious than that one. Is that for me? I. You know, let me kind of set the story up. My car had just got repossessed. I think this is 2010. My car got repossessed. Uh, you know, I was living with my mom and my sisters. We got evicted from an apartment. So literally, you know, all this stuff was happening in the same three week span, a month span. And I had a manager at the time that was trying to get me placements. And uh, man, this is almost like a two parter. Let me, which one I'm gonna tell them? 
Let me tell the first one. This one, oh yeah, this is gonna hurt. This is my first placement check. Okay. Rewind all of that. So I, I was pursuing placements. I remember one time I saw an a &R from a, a very known West Coast artist was like, yo, send some beats in, producers, here's an email. I sent some beats in, went to church, came home. They were like, yo, they want to place one of your beats. This artist and Mac 10 are going to be on a song together. Boom. This is you, you know? And I was like, wow, I'm about to get paid for my placement. I was excited. Uh, I, I, in, the, in the process, I was actually working on the album as as a artist, and I was trying to put that album out, but I needed a PR. I hired a PR, and she was willing to work for free until I got my placement check. I'm expecting my placement check to at least be a G or something, right? Fast forward, I finally get my placement check about six months later. I go in there. I'm walking. I meet the artist. I'm shaking hands. I'm like, yo, man, this is crazy you know financially things were kind of getting really really bad at that point this is right before i got ev we got evicted and I lost my car but got the check didn't even look at it shook his hand took the check went straight to the check and the cash because i'd ruined my relationship with the bank and took it out the the envelope and it was literally for the amount of 500 dollars, which is still good for that first placement but i literally owed my manager at, or my pr 480 dollars and I needed that money in order for us to not get evicted. And so I'm looking at it and I'm like, I can't even tell her not because she has her own obligations. She had just a baby coming on the way. So I couldn't even do that. And on top of that, the check was spelled in my artist name, my producer name and not my actual government name. So I'm sitting there at the check in the cash and you're like, we can't, we can't do it because you don't have any proof that you're Curtis King. Had to wait for another check for another two weeks, right? Check comes in, went to try to cash it. There was more issues with the check. A month passed, two months passed. We had to pack up. We're getting evicted. Finally, the check comes after we had to leave. It was already too late. I look on the address, and the address was literally 10 minutes away from my house. And nobody had ever mentioned it. And so I could literally walk up to the office, got that thing cleared away, and we would have, you know, it would have been a whole other situation. But I say that with a smile now only because... I, I know that life doesn't happen to you. Life, life happens for you. I have to believe that. And I have to believe that had I fixed that situation on time, had we got our place, how this life that I'm living now would not have been possible. You know, the, the E40 and MERS opportunity wouldn't have happened. Even his videos wouldn't have happened. Had I still had a safe and comfortable life, which I had when I was living with moms, it would have been a completely different outcome. And I'm thankful now for it happening. But it just hurts as you packing up all your stuff because you're being evicted and literally look at the check and just something said, let me check where the office is at. It's 10 minutes away from my house. And mind you, all the business was going on was like, you know, 40 miles or 50 miles away. So I thought that's where everything was at. But it's just one of the things where, you know, you know, if you believe in a higher power, I feel like God has a great sense of humor. And I feel like that was one of the situations that stuff happened. I got a million of those stories. And like I said, it's going to be in that book. Uh, the, the, uh, the, prosperous hip-hop producer. There's going to be a lot of those stories in that book, but man, I certainly appreciate you letting me share that uh, off-the-wall stories, but went a different, bunch of different directions, but that's the story. <laughs> yeah, okay, so for the people who want to order the book or pre-order the book uh, when it's ready to be pre-ordered, uh, how do they stay in touch with you? Uh, Curtis King, at Curtis King with two S's. At Curtis King on Twitter, Facebook, CurtisKing.com or CurtisKingBeats.com. I'm surely going to blast all that information out as soon as this book is ready. I'm looking forward to that. But other than that, I would definitely subscribe to the Curtis King TV channel on YouTube. And I try to keep everything pretty up to date, but that's about it. Curtis King, I appreciate you sitting down, taking some time to talk with us. Uh, Absolutely. I appreciate you having me on. And much, much success to you, especially with that book. You know, that's something that's that's pretty unprecedented. So all the success in the world to you. Thank you again. Thank you. I appreciate that.